So first of all, um, thank you very much to Jean-Louis for this invitation. When German architecture um, of 20th century is um, on the agenda, I don't exaggerate if I say that classical modernism and Bauhaus, you, you all know Bauhaus, dominate the narratives. But everybody who travels through the country and looks out for architecture from the 14 years of the Republic of Weimar, when modernism had its breakup, uh, will realize that in point of fact, the building production was quite different and closer to something else. Henry Russell Hitchcock already in 1929 had introduced the term of new tradition, a kind of non-modernist modern. One of the most influ influential architects of this new tradition in Germany was Paul Schmittener, born in um, 1884, in the same generation as the well-known protagonists of modernism, uh, Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, or Le Corbusier. I show you here two houses, to the left Le Corbusier, to the right Schmittener. Both uh, houses were built at Stuttgart, uh, in 1927 and in 1930, I, just to show the, the possible contrast of architectural positions in, in the late 1920s. Um, I, uh, in, in my presentation, um, I have made a very uh, selective choice of works of Schmidt and I. So, I mean, I, I don't show you, uh, you, you will not find out the whole quality of his work. I just have selected um, examples that show the, uh, uh, um, the relationship to politics. <laughs> so um, let me begin with a statement of 1933 by the young Philip Johnson, um, who called Schmidthenner on one hand an outspoken enemy of the modernist new objectivity. But on the other hand, he described his buildings as really made better and in terms of intention more modern than much in Germany. And this is, I think, a striking judgment by someone who at that time was a clear advocate of modernism in architecture and to whom, together with Henry Russell Hitchcock, we owe not less than the term international style, a label with long-range impact for nearly half a century. Schmidthenner grew up in Alsace, during the German period after 1870. As the son of an Alsatian mother and a civil servant immigrated from Germany. After leaving the Polytechnical School of Karlsruhe, where he had been a lazy student, as he admitted later, Schmidthenner was hired as city architect in Colmar in Alsace in 1907 at the age of 23, so very young. He soon felt embarrassed by the fact that at his building sites, the carpenters and the masoners understood much more of construction than him, the academically trained architect. So he was, in a way, ashamed um, by uh, this, this lack of experience he, he, he had not. So in, in his free hours, he joined the office of a private architect, Eduard Spittler, in order to be his apprentice, the building realized with the collaboration of Schmidthenner was the new orphanate of the city. And um, you see here, uh, I, I will uh, note, uh, noteworthy are some details here, such as the affinity to buildings from uh, around 1800, framings of windows and corner strips in red natural stone, uh, which uh, Le Gré des Vosges, hmm? typical elements of vernacular architecture in Alsace. Through Spittler, Schmidthenner came into contact with a very self-conscious cultural and architectural regionalism in Alsace, which in this special territory, not necessarily, but sometimes carried a spirit of political opposition against Berlin, against Prussian dominance in the Bismarck Empire. With an improved understanding of region and crafts, Schmidthenner restored a city gate in Riquevier, a small city in Alsace, famous for its wines. This and a small, um, small custom post uh, in regionalist architecture uh, in Colmar are the only objects officially known as 
uh, of his work from that early period. Let me skip some stations of uh, Schmidtenner's career to see the architect in 1914 arrived in Berlin at the Imperial Ministry of the Interior. He had been hired for a program for garden cities for workers of state-owned armament factories. Schmidtenner realized a much noted series of exemplary estates in which entries into reform were given a chance, such as garden city, cooperative housing, real estate reform, and contemporary housing hygiene. You see here uh, the plan of Starken uh, near Berlin um, from 1914 to 1917. It was the first and biggest one of these garden cities built under strict economic limits so that efforts in ra rational planning and construction were needed. In the plan, we have houses grouped together in the manner of a modular system. Only five different floor plans. Uh, you see them in the graphic scheme on the left um, and uh, with elevations at the bottom of the plan. Uh, so five different floor plans are given as basic metrics of five types only but with great variety in the facades. On this basis, a large number of equally standardized finishing elements were built in. Um, here, for the first time in the country, and certainly unexpected from the side of an institution commonly seen as reactionary, I mean, the ministry from the Kaiser, yeah? Mm -hmm. And certainly, um, a systematic use was made of standardized types of ground plans and building components. Schmidtenner's main objective, however, was to make this Garden City a pioneering project in standardization, but to evitate its aesthetic consequence, uh, which might turn into monotony. So Starken is rich in elements which cater um, to the nostalgic longing of the modern industrial worker for the familiar order and manageable size of small town, small town life, evoking the images of the North German Heimat. You see here the marketplace um, of that garden city, houses with shops, facades in brick, like in northern Germany, and um, there were this, this, a special thing um, um, remembering the Dutch quarter of Potsdam, Potsdam, this, this city near Berlin, of the 18th century, these, these with these uh, gables and. It's a, it's a fine example to show how Schmidtenner uh, uh, could switch from uh, Alsace regionalism into a Brandenburg regionalism, um, looking at the landscape nearby. Starken was uh, one of the prototypes foreseen to replace the speculative housing fabric of Berlin with very high density and lousy hygiene at that time very uh, ill-reputated and for good reasons attacked by the activists of reform. But before Berlin could continue its growth with garden cities and modern settlements, there was World War I. After the ceasefire of November 1918, five years of permanent political crisis followed, which feed it, on, on one hand feed it political and architectural utopia, but gave few chances to realizations on a bigger scale. And in the first moments of the re revolution of 1918, the avant-garde of artists and architects gathered in the uh, Arbeitsrat für Kunst, uh, in English, Workers' Council for the Arts, under a program where artists devoted themselves to the people, to the masses, and to their needs which had been ignored for so long. And um, they did it with the slogan, Art and People United. Um, and um, in the field of architecture, now every building uh, sh should be controlled by the avant-garde, with the aim of a, a große Baukunst, a great architecture uh, uh, in a, for a future period of peace and for a united people. Um, in this council, there were 56 members, among them 11 architects. For example, there was Walter Gropius, Bruno Taut, and Hans Scharun. They were well-known protagonists who some years later will be in front of the modernist movement. 
of new objectivity. But in the first years after the revolution, these three and some more are also members of the more exclusive circle of artists called uh, Gläserne Kette, chain of glass, and their sketches show utopian crystalline cathedrals for a not yet defined revolutionary cult of unity and solidarity. This was very much inspired by Bruno Taut's glass house from the Werkbund exhibition in Cologne in 1914. Here I show it to you together with, um, with uh, such a fantasy by Hans Scharoun. In the Council of Artists, all members were convinced of being avant-garde, on duty for the new republic and for a vague idea of socialism, but, and this difference really matters, it was not yet an avant-garde of a defined modernist architecture. Um, uh, here was uh, um, um, the, the forces of progress and tradition were still under the same roof. Please see these three architects, members of the council too. They are the pra pragmatic wing of the council, Paul Schmidtenner again, Heinrich Tessenau, and Walter Kurt Behrendt. Later in 1919, we find them in the board of a new review, Die Volkswohnung, uh, Housing for the People, founded from, uh, uh, out of the Council of Artists in order to find strategies to fight one of the most urging problems of the Republic, the disastrous housing shortage. One of the key articles in the constitution of the, the Republic of Weimar had been number 115, proclaiming the right to an, uh, the, the Recht auf Wohnung, huh? the right to an appropriate habitat for every citizen, a task absolutely impossible to accomplish in view of the miserable conditions during the years of crisis, but stimulating, uh, very stimulating after 1923, when a new currency was introduced, and um, um, when uh, a tax on real estate uh, uh, became the basis um, for the extensive housing programs in the cities. With Schmidtenner on board, the review was active in this field with all sorts of proposals how to enable housing at minimum cost. Mm -hmm. uh, among the contributions to the review of Schmidtenner, we find here a system of normalized windows in 1920. Um, um, and this was uh, uh, later uh, nearly exactly copied by Ernst May for the housing program at Frankfurt, which became the hotspot of public housing in combination with modernist architecture in Germany uh, uh, after 1925. Another element of uh, new Frankfurt model furniture uh, used as a, as, a, as a means for education of tenants um, who should learn how to live as uh, modern people. Hmm? Um, this example also had been given by Schmidtenner before in Starken 10 years earlier. Um, you see his proposals to the right. Hmm? And the difference is, I mean, uh, the Schmidtenner's furniture for Starken is, is simple and functional, but uh, may, I mean, the, the cupboard may look also like 1800. Um, not yet with the aesthetics of serial production. I need not tell you what happened at the same time um, uh, after the November Revolution, um, following uh, the 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 uh, um, following the ceasefire uh, of 1918 and the field of education in arts and architecture. In March 1919, at Weimar, we have the first Bauhaus. It was founded then by Walter Gropius. Um, you see it here with its initial symbol, the cathedral drawn by Feininger, saying that the building of the future would be a total work of art, which embraces all sections of art and crafts, and that artists shall be craftsmen, no, no more hierarchy among and all that summarized in the slogan, uh, this, is, this is now important, this, the slogan, crafts and art, a new unity. And look at the Bauhaus logo to the left, an expressionist collage, a little bit chaotic, with a stick man uh, representing the merge of artists and craftsmen, 
holding a roof, evoking traditional signs of guilds, surrounded by a ring of letters, drawn by hand. Very important. Deliberately rough. And see what happens in 1923, the new logo, a typified silhouette of man, rational, simple, drawn with rule and circle with the accuracy of the machine. It symbolizes the radical turn initiated by Gropius towards a merge of arts with industrial production. Right after the war, in the Weimar Bauhaus, at the beginning, uh, industry had been banned from vocabulary as it evoked the horror of war and stood for the mass production of weapons and ammunition during the first industrialized war in history. In 1923, industry is now back in mind, not least under the influence of the book of Henry Ford, published in, Germany, in German during the same year. In the architecture branch of the Bauhaus, Gropius with students began to dream of industrial production and the field of housing. Another school which made history in the first moments of the Weimar Republic with Paul Schmidtenner as a protagonist on board is ignored in most of the narratives. In October 1918, Schmidtenner, due to his efforts at Starken at, uh, at the Faculty of Architecture um, in Stuttgart, had been appointed to a chair for building construction. Together with his colleague Paul Bonatz, he made use of the revolutionary situation and with the support of the first democratic government already in November 1918, I mean, this is, this is weeks after the ceasefire, yeah? Um, they realized a fundamental reform and created the so-called Stuttgarter Schule, School of Stuttgart, which became the most important stronghold of new tradition in Germany. No manifesto was written. I mean, these people had no idea of managing media. And there was no primary slogan such as crafts and art uh, a new unity, but the accent on craft was very close to the first Bauhaus. The education became pragmatic instead of academic. Here you see um, uh, their buildings, I mean, uh, up uh, uh, to the right, the uh, central station of, uh, made by Bonatz and uh, a typical settlement of Schmidtenner after the war. Um, there was no more training in luxurious great buildings like before, but in everyday jobs like homes, factories, schools. Function and objectivity ranked over representation. The training in opulent and sophisticated rendering was given up in favor of a modest but accurate drawing. The use of rule and lettering stencil was more or less forbidden. The student was admonished to use his hand at all points. But before 1918, it had been possible that diploma were given to students who were masters in rendering but never had seen a building site. Now, only an apprenticeship in traditional building branch enabled to become a student. The teaching may be summarized in three polarities. Exercise, ranked over theory. Substance, over representation. Experience, over experiment. Above all, a rigid morality of craftsmanship. Architectural solutions, which were not based in qualified material and in a logical and decent construction, were not considered as serious. The use of concrete and steel was not bad, but in the perspective of craftsmen's morality, it ranked below brick, stone, and timber. Please look at this hand-drawn drawing by Schmidtenner himself for a small holiday house, which illustrates the principles of the school. At the elevation, some lines give the choice of the material. To the right, in large-scale details in section, showing how the joint from roof to wall is mastered, how a window is cut into the wall. The juxtaposition of elevations and constructive details is, is crucial here as it teaches the connection of the constructive basis and the aesthetical effect of it. It was especially the reputation of Schmidtenner's lectures, uh, who was a charismatic teacher, by the way, which let the School of Stuttgart become the most popular education for architecture during two decades, with many, many, many more students than the Bauhaus. To understand the morale of this version of um, 
German new tradition, it is useful to look at a small house from pre-industrial 18th century in Weimar. A cubic volume in a garden covered with white plaster, two stories, high hip roof with plain tiles, at the wall uh, a wooden grid for flowers. If you say at first glance, not an interesting house, I agree. Architects before 1900 just would have passed. Only in this case, it is indeed a, a historical monument of first rank, as it was the summer house of Johann Wolfgang Goethe, the great poet of German language. After 1900, uh, German intellectuals fell in love with his house. It was, it was uh, a prime example for decent and modest domesticity, cultivated by a hero of literature, who of course uh, had the means to afford something uh, much more rich. In its minimalism, it was the perfect antithesis of the bourgeois villa before 1900, with its high decorated nouveau riche show off. Being functional, well proportioned, and solid in detail, lacking ornament and facade, it was close to virtues of the modern. Around 1910, architects of the early modern began to build mere copies of it. Here you see, to the right, you see a house of Heinrich Tessenow in the first German garden city of Hellerau near Dresden. For his teaching, Schmidtener had sent out students to Weimar for a building measurement of the Goethe House. You see it here on, on, the, on the left. Until World War II, Schmidtener realized dozens of paraphrased versions equipped with contemporary technique. By the way, in the uh, same year when uh, Schmidtener's Rosa House was built uh, in 1925, uh, Mies van der Rohe, you see him on the left, finished the last house of his new tradition series before he finally converted to flat roof and open volumes. So there is a certain parallelity. For Schmidt-Henner's Rosa House in Stuttgart of 1925, um, our Italian colleague Nicola Panzini uh, has uh, analyzed the proportions, you see it here on, on the right. The peri perimeter fits into a quadrat, which is divided in two, so that the house and roof have the same height. And remarkably, and the facade is symmetry, but slightly moved out of the middle axis. Hmm? Another Schmidtenner house of the same type, built in 1928 in a model settlement of a group of new tra tradition architects in Berlin, in direct confrontation opposite the modernist settlement of Uncle Tom's Hütte by Bruno Taut and other architects. To the right, you see flat roofs and clean plaster. To, to the left, pitched roof, massive volume, modeled with a thin surface of lime plaster so that the relief of bricks uh, shines through. While Bruno Taut shows form, Schmidtenner shows material. That was the idea. Here, uh, the front, uh, the same house the, with its front to the garden. Again, the architect, architect makes us think that there is symmetry, but if you focus the proportions, you see that it is willfully disturbed. The upper windows do not exactly stand above the lower ones. The garret window in the roof um, is moved out of the middle axis, and uh, the two chimneys, which uh, what of course was not necessary, um, have different forms. Minimal manipulations which only the watchful shall see. Other architects um, of that time have used this in order to mystify their facades. Uh, here you see um, a wonderful example by Gunnar Asplund uh, in Sweden, the Snellmann House in Djursholm of 1917-18 but uh, they never gave reasons for it. I really have never ever found uh, uh, an architect to explain this. In the case of Schmidtenner, I understand it as an anti-rational moment, giving his house an organic character in opposition to the industrial machine à habiter then in vogue. Since 1925, the Schmidtenner house and its variations um, was widely published and became a kind of a brand and Schmidtener himself published his houses in 1932, hmm? a very popular book. For a part of the German public, it incarnated permanence and timelessness, 
that means values which help the middle classes to tolerate the uncertainties of modern times. Critiques from the side of modernism saw them as an expression of obsolete romanticism out of place in 20th century. In the year 1927, on the doorstep of Schmittener School, um, with houses of Le Corbusier, uh, Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, Adolf Loos, and 13 other architects, the Weissenhof exhibition and settlement took place in Stuttgart. It was a major event for media and brought the breakthrough for modernism and new objectivity. In the same year, Schmidhenner restarted his, his efforts in rationalization already practiced at the Starken Garden City. On a site in Stuttgart, less than, only less than 400 meters away from the Weissenhof, but ignored by the media and by the colleagues, a complete house of the Goethe type was erected in only five days. His system, uh, called Fafa, consisted of prefabricated story-high wooden frames with windows and doors already set in them. Fafa, it means fabricated timber work, was based in regional traditions of construction in wood, but there were also affinities to the American balloon frame system. So here you have um, day two, day three, day six. And here you have uh, a detail of day four. The Weissenhof houses too showed innovative materials and techniques for sure. However, on behalf of cost saving, a crucial point for the state and for the financement of public social housing at that time, the results were very disappointing. Especially for the city government of Stuttgart, which had financed the Weissenhof in order to receive a substantial reduction of cost um, so that more flats could be realized with the same budget. Um, for this reason, to Schmidhenner, a settlement with 200 flats was commissioned, including 75 units in conventional construction with brick walls, so that both methods could be compared. At the end, Schmidhenner's Fafa reached a cost reduction of 24%, while Gropius and his colleagues with their experimental projects never achieved more than 10. For Gropius, who had dreamed of being the German Henry Ford of housing, it must have been a shameful experience to be outrun by arrival from new tradition. But Schmidhenner's success was, happened too late to influence social housing and um, um, because uh, uh, um, in the meantime, we had Black Friday and the world, world economic crisis uh, did begin, which resulted in a, in a complete collapse of the funding, funding of social housing by the state. Um, yeah, you, we have here a completely different access uh, to the problem. Uh, Gropius, uh, in his rhetorics, um, in his rhetorics, was the number one of prefabrication and cost saving. And uh, saying this, he organized to move the Bauhaus from Weimar to Dessau. Hmm? But, I mean, he failed. And um, he was a master in theory. And, I mean, uh, it, uh, there is a certain explanation. Schmidhenner had built many, many, many houses. Uh, Thousands and Gropius. If you look at Gropius, what he did in housing, it is maybe hundred hmm, up to then. So um, here we have a publication from 1927, published during the Weissenhof event, proclaiming the victory of the modernist movement in architecture as definite and irreversible. The author Walter Kurt Behrendt once had been an ally. We, we had him at the, at the board of the Volkswohnung Review. Um, he had promoted Schmidhenner's early work. Now he held a chief position in the building department of the Prussian Ministry of Finance with the power to carry his point over all governmental building activities of the state in Prussia, and that was more than half of the German territory. So now he was not anymore a friend. Some new tradition architects, among them Paul Schmidhenner and Paul Bonatz, were not willing to accept. In 1928, they founded a conservative lobby group of architects called Block, which had been seen as an, has been seen as an anticipation of later Nazi positions, in a way correctly, in another way not. 
The manifesto was moderate. It confirmed the impact of function of new materials and work forms, but not at any price. It rather insisted in fostering inherited and already well-crafted things. And it positioned architecture away from the internationalism of Gropius as an issue of the own nation, based on the views of life of the own people and the circumstances of the nature of the country which have to be taken into account. Among the members, we find architects who are completely unsuspicious of political sympathy to Nazi positions, such as Hans Pölzig, Werner Hegemann. Werner Hegemann emigrated uh, uh, in, the in the first days of Nazi uh, government. Or, for example, Fritz Schumacher, who was the city architect in Hamburg, a social democratic city through and through. Uh, but there was also uh, Paul Schulz in Hamburg in the ranks of architectural reform, a man of great merit before 1914, but now one of the first architects openly taking side of the Nazis and a distinct racist. With his book Kunst und Rasse, uh, Art and Race, he denounced modern art and architecture as a symptom of racial decline. In 1931, the Jewish architect Alexander Klein known for his sophisticated studies to rationalized floor plans, was about to become a, mem a member of the bloc. He later emigrated to Palestine and became the leading teacher for urbanism at the Technion in Israel. Schulz in Naumburg, the racist, refused his membership, and, um, um, and so he stayed outside. And some liberal members, among them, uh, Bonatz and Hegemann took the occasion and left the group under protest. Mm -hmm. Schmidt Henner stayed, probably um, as Schulze Naumburg was a potential ally for certain ambitions towards a career with a national socialist government, which in 1931 existed not yet, but uh, at that time was already was a possibility for the future. Opportunism here did win over solidarity, and this was Schmidt-Henner's position between 1931 and 1934, very clearly. These were his definite Nazi years, again close to politics. He spoke at events of the National Socialist Federation for Culture. In summer 1932, he gave his signature for a public appeal pro-Hitler at the elections for the Reichstag. And in spring 1933, we see him in negotiations with the first National Socialist government, which offers him the very influential position of a supervisor over all schools of architecture in Prussia. But then he passes and prefers to stay in his chair at the School of Stuttgart. His mission would have been the, the radical purge of the schools from dissidents and non-Aryans among the teaching personnel, which he was not willing to execute. In spite of his withdrawal, the nomination was published as if it was real, and so for a moment in 1933, many did see Schmidt-Henner as the forthcoming first architect of the regime. Um, here, you have, uh, here you have architectural re review from London, May 1933, and uh, this review, uh, some months after Hitler came to power, looks at Germany and looks, I mean, he will, who will be, uh, who will have the jobs? And I mean, uh, at least uh, already Speer has arrived, yeah, uh, with his uh, decoration for the National Labor Day, 1st of May, uh, 1933. But in second rank, you have schmidt -Henner. Hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, schmidt -Henner's career had arrived in stagnation. And in... Um, 1934, when another appeal um, of cultural workers uh, for the support of Hitler was published and signed, for example, by Mies van der Rohe, who at that time uh, still had ambitions, it did not bear anymore the signature of schmidt -Henner. Mm -hmm. In 1934, a conflict occurred with Hitler personally, who more and more took decisions on architecture himself. Schmidt Henner had been installed as the official architect for the German pavilion at Brussels World Fair in 1935. His designs had not been, have not been preserved. The only source we have is a rough sketch on the backside of a letter cover. 
uh, that you have here. Um, a large symmetrical hall in timber work foreseen to be removed after the exhibition, non-monumental and cheap, due to Schmidt-Henner's favor for a crafted construction and to his idea that the, the, the Reich, that Germany, impoverished by the econ economical crisis, should perform an attitude of modesty uh, with, with dignity. This little sketch on a letter is the only surviving image of his design, together with the pavilion of Albert Speer at the exhibition, uh, at the Exposition Internationale of 1937 in Paris. Hitler ridiculed the design as haystack, not appropriate for the first international appearance of his regime, and dismissed the architect from his mission. Another loser uh, in the planning process for Brussels was Mies van der Rohe, who still remained in Germany waiting for a serious invitation from the regime. In the restricted competition held after schmidt henners defeat, the design of Mies in the layout not far from the Barcelona Pavilion of 1929, had failed too. At the end, no pavilion was built as because of the Luta problems, because Germany was really poor at that time. Germany did not participate. In the meantime, Albert Speer had become the definite leading architect of the regime and the alter ego of the architect Marquet, Adolf Hitler, who more and more took decisions on architecture himself. You know the result, a new representative architecture for Germany as the fascist superpower was developed in a, a hypertropic neoclassicism, ready to break with any proportion and urban scale. schmidt was convinced that more and more the official architectural architecture was the opposite of his own philosophy and of the teaching uh, of his school. He answered in ciphered aphorisms during his lecture such as the first thing that dying people lose is scale. His lecture with a cryptic title The Gentle Law in the Arts, especially in architecture, became an insider tip and was even published several times until 1943. On the cover you see the silhouette of the Strasbourg <laughs> Cathedral. schmidt the man from Alsace, took it as an example of what he understood as true greatness in architecture, out of reach for the architects uh, around Speer. In Berlin, Friedrich Tams, an architect in the team of Speer, was authorized to publish a counterstatement printed in March 1944. It confronted schmidt with a hard law uh, uh, in architecture, uh, and it said that buildings of always some monumental greatness had been created during history all the time and that the National Socialist great projects were legitimate and based in a glorious continuity since the pyramids, pyramids here. And as uh, uh, a proof, uh, uh, the Strasbourg Cathedral is given again, now in a, in a, in a different sense, a deliberately sarcastic revenge against schmidt mm -hmm. However, schmidt was not consequent in his opposition. At several occasions, he still took part in competitions for representative projects, but he conceived um, his designs as pure architectural studies with no possibility for realization, as from 1940 on, he did not believe anymore that Germany would win the war. Look here at his design for a court with stapled arcades at a future polytechnical school at Linz in Austria. The drawing was published in 1941. When we checked the original drawing, we, we, we had it at the schmidt exhibition in 2003 in Frankfurt. We found out that over the two portals, you, you see one of them here on the right, he had scratched out three swastikas before he gave the piece to the photographer. That means in 1941, and not after 1945, to wipe out a Nazi past before denazification, uh, he did this. In a way, the drawing returned to him, and he liked to think that it was his private study with no more connection to politics and to the regime, of course, a self-pleasing illusion. And have a look to another great project, the competition for a monumental upgrade of Strasbourg, which since the annexion of 1940 was German again, only for a short time. Um, 
On one hand, Schmidt-Henna uh, appreciated the return of his land to Germany. Hmm? On, on the other hand, he was split into identities, the Alsatian uh, from origin and the, and the German patriot he, he, uh, he became. When in 1943, seven men from Alsace with contact to the French resistance faced the death penalty, uh, he dared launch an open letter to the law court in order to save the lives and asked his friends to follow his example. I mean, at that time, a very courageous act. And he was successful with that. Um, it later helped Schmitana to make friends with a French military governor in Germany, but that would be another story. Now, I am ready, but two footnotes, please. Um, Strasbourg, this plan for Strasbourg, of course, was not realized. But few people know, at downright, at Stuttgart, Königsplatz, there is a Schmidtenner building from 1950 for Dresdner Bank, uh, then, still the, uh, uh, then still under a light, that means American control. And the facade scheme um, uh, was, had been developed for Strasbourg, uh, and now, in a, in a very much slimmed version, less heavy, um, it was used uh, for this building in, in Stuttgart. So we have a fragment of the Strasbourg plan survived on the other side of the Rhine. And a second footnote. Um, J'aurais pu ce texte en français. <laughs> Mais... Uh, Vous comprenez peut-être ça, ça euh, 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 il aurait fallu euh, quelques jours plus pour élaborer ça et j'avais pas ce temps. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci.